lucky Diane yeah I, th I think it's it, these are these discussions that you know you know I, I know that there had previously more recently been you know debates around extending the 67 act to Northern Ireland and then these plans sort of get pushed as you say via parliamentary procedure sometimes to, to stop them happening um, and it's always interesting to hear about that sort of as you say the horse trading that goes on behind closed doors so I suppose so 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 that was the 67 act and can you just tell me because this is one of my one of my favorite of, of your stories um, about the day that the 67 act passed and how you celebrated it was the ninth that we knew it would pass. It didn't come into effect till it got the Queen's assent. But the all night long lost a very many. I'd spend all night speech writing for MPs who are almost dead on their feet breathing them out. Um, we knew it would go through. The third reading had gone through, it had gone to the Lords, it had come back, and it was going to become law. And I think it was about two or three o'clock in the morning. And it was, it was in June. And early in the morning, we were all sitting on the terrace. I can remember David Steele being there, Lord Silkin had been the person who got it through the, the House of Lords. And we were eating strawberries and drinking champagne. And I said, I am only having a half glass of champagne because I believe our job is only half done. I had always believed, as I do now, that there is one person and one person only who should make the final decision. That doesn't mean she shouldn't discuss it with other people. Arguments against it should be brought to her. But in the end, she is the one that carries that child. She is the one that gives birth. And still, not as much perhaps as then, but in our society, she is the one who carries the burden of its upbringing. I have always believed that in the long run, it is only the woman who can decide. And when I'm discussing that, I go back to my own thinking in a relatively comfortable position when that fourth pregnancy was concerned, confirmed, nothing and nobody would have made me have that child. That drive, an instinctive drive, I believe, to have an abortion is strong. The main maternal drive is to have children. We see that all around us. And my screen is flashing up, your internet connection is unstable, just as a warning. I suspect Bill a grandson, you, Diane. Um, I suspect a grandson who lives with me is probably on a Zoom meeting as well, because he's working from home. But um, it's gone, so I'm still here. You are still here, very much so. That's wonderful. Um, I mean, I sort of, it, it really strikes me that in 1967, you know, the, the issues that you had with the Act, the, your, your personal opposition to some of those clauses in the Act, you know, they're, they're still in place today. Um, and I know that you've been campaigning um, for, you know, abortion rights throughout. You didn't, you definitely didn't hang up your hat in 1967. So, why do you think that, you know, we haven't made the progress yet? I mean, I, you know, I, I do think that we have come a long way quite recently, you know, whether it's decriminalization in Northern Ireland or it's the development of telemedicine here. So I do certainly think there have been victories, but why do you think that those aspects of the Abortion Act, you know, are still in place today? It's I mean, I was instrumental in setting up what was then the Birmingham Pregnancy Advisory Service because throughout the campaigns, um, there were areas of the country who had gynecological obstetric consultants who said they would not move their babies, whatever the law said, and Birmingham was one of them. 
and very briefly, the Birmingham branch of the Abortion Law Reform Association, where there was a professor, and I was on television with him the morning after the act was passed, and he actually said, whatever the law says, we will not murder little babies in Birmingham. And in fact, um, we started up an organization I wanted to call Abortions Anonymous. And in discussing it on the our Abortion Law Reform Association Committee, um, Vera Hutton, the chairman, suggested that what we were proposing, which was sympathetic doctors who would see women outside of the health service for a very low fee, in fact it was two shillings at that time, or 40 pence, um, no 20 pence, it was two shillings, and refer them to sympathetic doctors in order to receive legal abortions. And it was the charity commissioners, which I still find funny, who decided that Abortions Anonymous could not be a charity because to have charitable status, one needed to benefit a sufficiently large section proportion of the population. And it was their belief that so few women would require to use the Abortion Act and end their pregnancies to assist them could not be charitable. And they came up with the name Pregnancy Advisory Service because they said at any one time there were sufficient pregnant women in the population to make giving them advice fit a charitable purpose. So that is how the Birmingham Pregnancy Advisory Service, which is now BPAS, came about. I, I think that probably, I mean, in 1974, there were various changes taking place. The women's movement was being formed. They were taking on the role of abortion. With the law having been changed, the, we were still aware that the law about contraception was poor. We had put the cart before the horse. Um, in the contraception was no, still not available on the health service, not available to young people without parents, not available to the unmarried. And the birth control trust was formed and took our main activists. I had stayed behind and indeed in those years I thought of 16 attempts to amend or destroy the abortion act. In fact, that number is now nearly 50. So part of the anti-abortion lobby have been so successful in bringing things to Parliament that in fact the efforts, um, the parliamentary energy has all been taken up defending them. I mean, and I've got to copy it out, some people, where's my camera, will remember this book Babies for Burning, lies were told. Um, Donald Trump often reminds me of the anti-abortion lobby. Um, that was a book that, in fact, um, got huge circulation. I spoke at public meetings where the whole audience stood up and just waved copies of this, this black and white book. Um, that BPA has took to the High Court and defeated. The woman, Susan Kentish, uh, went round saying she missed her period, she thought she was pregnant, told a story that convinced doctors and had a tape recorder in her back. We took, she really slandered BPAS very, very badly. The book is full of libels 
This one can't see it on there, but paragraph after paragraph, I had highlighted of what was untrue. And when we took this to the High Court, we got a discovery order, which meant we got her transcripts. And I can remember cooking a Christmas dinner with a tape recorder on and the book open and the transcript on the kitchen table beside the potatoes I was painting, marking up where they had done it. They accused a doctor, a doctor whose father had been killed in the Holocaust, a Jewish doctor, of selling fetuses for making soap. And that sort of story hit the headlines. And in the early 70s, there were two anti-abortion bills that would have destroyed the law. Both got second readings. So I spent a lot of time, eventually, the day before the trial, and I was very, very sad about that. I'd spent four years of my life preparing this case, detailed sentence by sentence. They withdraw, drew, and apologized. In fact, I recently found it still being sold on the internet. And I looked, um, looked it up on Google, and I wrote saying the book that the sellers were selling it illegally had it been agreed in the High Court it would be withdrawn. Um, and a letter was written, which I know from his style was by one of the authors of the book, so they're still around. But there have been, to go back to your original question, roughly 50 attempts in Parliament, some serious, some very serious, to amend or destroy the law. So all of our attention, all of our energies were taken in, in fighting those. And only recently do I detect a big change in Parliament. I think that vote that we had last year on Britain taking over the Northern Ireland thing because the Stormont wasn't functioning and could not play its role. I think that that was the turning point. I actually feel hopeful that we will, and perhaps the one silver lining of the coronavirus is that the rules that have been put in place for telemedicine, for teleconsultations, the sending out of the abortion pill by post will be the one good thing that has come out of this pandemic if, in fact, we can get it put into law for the future. And then perhaps I can have my other half class of show <laughs> <laughs> okay, Diane, I am going to be, we are going to be working hard on that, not only because we think it's the right thing for women, but because I'm really looking forward to drinking a glass of champagne with you, maybe followed by some sherry and some homemade cakes. Um, so we've had lots of questions, and just for those people who have put in um, a message for Diane, I'm going to forward those to her after the event just so that we could get through some of the questions. But all of your lovely comments are going to be passed on to Diane, and then she can blush and hold her head in her hand in the privacy of her own home. Um, but Diane, one of, the, one of the questions that's been raised, and I think it's quite interesting, because I don't think we've ever discussed this, um, what are your thoughts on conscientious objection? Obviously, that's still very much, you know, a part of the law as it stands. And I just wondered, you know, yeah, how you felt about that at the time, now, or just in general? At the time, when it was introduced, I believe that people have the right to conscientious objection, but they don't have the right to, prevent, to stop other people's consciences. And I think, I think that clause should go now. I mean, I have sometimes said when there was a huge campaign by doctors and nurses led by the Roman Catholic Church, which has always been the main opponent. It's the elephant in the room, but I think it has to bear 
each share of the plane for the failure to further liberalise the law. And where was I going? I think that um, I've lost the thread. Oh, no, don't worry. Um, I mean, I think one of the interesting... Oh, sorry, go for it. I think it was right that the conscience clause should be there. In the right, I believe, and this is raised in said recently, that conscience is getting in the way of some religious pharmacists from actually dispensing the pill. But in the way that people, um, Jews don't decide to become poor pictures. Jehovah's Witnesses don't decide to work in the blood transfusion service, and if they did, they would be laughed out of court. So it does seem to me that people who a job for whom the job description, and that might be whether a very limited number of staff in the hospital or on a maternity ward are not prepared to do something. They should either not have that job or there should be adequate provision for somebody else to do it. They may not solve their consciences at the cost of somebody else's. In theory, I believe we should all have the right to follow our consciences in the way I believe in free speech, unless it harms somebody else and then ways have to be found around it. Yeah, no, completely. I think that's a that's a very, yeah, I, I agree completely with you. And I also think what's really nice is that I've, you know, over the last, um, over the last however many years I've been at BPAS, I've learned a new phrase, which is conscientious commitment. And that there's obviously, while some people, you know, the focus is all on conscientious objection, but actually our staff have a conscientious commitment and it, their conscience tells them it is the right thing to do. It's not just those who are opposed to abortion rights that have consciences. In fact, it's the conscience of our doctors no. and nurses and midwives that drive them to provide the care that they Indeed, need. Indeed, I agree with you completely. Okay. Um, we've got some other questions coming through, and yes, and I will, and I will completely pass on all, all your messages. Um, but there's a couple of questions that have come through from, um, including one from a, a young woman, Georgia, who's 25. And she says that there's still reservations and a sense of shame when it comes to talking about abortion. And what would you say to that generation? How can they break down that stigma that's still there? I don't, my answer has to be, I don't know. <laughs> I think only they can do it. When you look, at the situation in Ireland, I believe that their law was changed, that one of the main factors was women speaking out. I'm an old woman now, can't get pregnant. Um, and it has to be the young women. They should hold their heads high. They have made a conscientious, decision about what is right for them at that time and that should be respected and i really i don't know what you think you two were involved in that campaign that in ireland the powerful thing was women telling their stories i think my power during all those years of campaigning when I actually, when I added it up for a book that was being written, I had spoken publicly, whether it was to newspaper articles, radio, television, university debates, meetings in village halls. I had spoken out over a thousand times. Wow. And it was based on my experience and what has been called my lack of conscience, lack of shame. And I think it is for these young women to actually, they have to deal with this feeling. Um, I didn't have a feeling of shame. Maybe I'm just a shameless husband. I'm worse. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel it, 
It was a huge omission that I didn't include the phrase shameless hussy in your introduction. I must do better next time. Um, yes. And just on the topic of Ireland, um, we've had a question in to say, um, you know, dur during your time campaigning for abortion rights, did you ever spend any time in Ireland or do any sort of campaigning over there? I actually, just in the 60s, and I came across notes, I did a debate at Trinity College in Dublin on abortion should be legal in Ireland. And do you want a funny story? Yes, always. It was at the time and this is when there was a huge postal strike on here. And at that time, the only way women in Ireland could get contraception was having it sent to them in plain envelopes, having sheets, condoms sent by post in envelopes, handwritten. And we had had a postal strike, and I was going to Dublin to do this debate. And I got in touch with the Planned Parenthood Federation, the Planned Parenthood Federation in London, who were the main distributors, and said, I'm going to Dublin. If you give me these, a load of contraceptives, I will actually post them in Dublin. So I had this huge suitcase full of envelopes of contraceptives. My husband took me to the airport here and said to me, what are you going to do if they open it? I said, oh, I'll say they're all for my own use. <laughs> that was the only reason you were allowed to win them. However, the plane broke down on the runway at Heathrow, and I found myself sitting next to an Irish gentleman um, who started up a conversation, and I wanted to read my book. So he said to me, what are you going to Ireland for? So I said, I'm going to debate about abortion at Trinity College, thinking this would shut him up. <laughs> Instead of which, he informed me he was one of eight children, and one of his brothers was a priest, and two of his sisters were nuns, and he went on and on and on about the inequities of abortion. Anyway, we eventually got to Dublin. I got off the plane. I went to the carousel to get my very large weekend suitcase, stuffed full of contraceptives. And he came up behind me and said, let me carry that for you. So I walked out of Dublin Airport, where there's a huge sign up you have to go under, of all the forbidden imports. And first among them was contraceptives. And there was this very religious Irish gentleman carrying about 500 packs of condoms. And that image stays with me forever. I but I, I actually won the debate. Oh. It was at, at Trinity. And I had actually been on for it. My picture was on the front of the Irish Times the next day. And I wondered if he read it, but he was a farmer. I don't think he'd have read the Times. He wasn't going to read that. For a second, Diane, I thought you were going to say that he grabbed your bag and it then just like bust open and all these <laughs> condoms uh, went well, They were all sealed envelopes, but I stood in the middle of the main post office where well, the uprising started in the middle of Dublin and put them one at a time and let them <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, that's great. Um, that's a that's a really lovely story that unfortunately we're going to have to end on because we've just run over a little bit. Um, but thank you all so much for joining and for all your lovely comments, which are going to be sent directly to Diane. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of your questions, um, but sorry I have lots of my end. on screen. Sorry. Do the questions need answering? So, let's actually, yeah, so there's one, so I've got a question here um, from Jennifer, who is sort of, look, who, who is looking for your thoughts around um, the harassment outside, outside abortion clinics and whether or not, you know, there's debates at the moment as to whether or not that should be viewed as a hate crime. 
I don't know if that's something that you have any thoughts on at the moment. Yes, interesting. I've recently been asked to prepare some evidence for the European Court, which is looking at this matter. And I actually got my evidence out before speaking to you today. It was the, um, I got an invitation here from the European. And first, I think one needs to say this is not new. I have got a BBC documentary made back in the 70s outside our Liverpool clinic, Merseyside Nursing Home, that I took part in, where we had demonstrations to which I called the police. People were actually chaining themselves to the railings. They tried to enter the clinic. They were much, much more active in those days. They didn't just stand there and pray. They tried to get in to destroy um, medical equipment, to talk to people in waiting rooms. And I can remember standing there where they all laid down in the gateway and the police had to remove them one at a time. There was a priest called Father Morrow, who I debated with many times, who went to prison because of his activities. So this is not new, it has gone on and on and on. And I'm often challenged because I have spoken on free speech and I don't think it's a valid argument against it. I do think that we need a national law because it's all right getting these local ones. They last, I think, these um, stop actions for only one or two years and then they have to be applied for again. It costs local authorities thousands of pounds and a lot of time in applying for them and it is not denying free speech. It is saying that they can't make those speeches in one place, a very limited place within a hundred meters instead of a clinic. Um, I believe it's long overdue. It should be a national law and I was delighted. I mean, I gave loads of examples in my evidence of the things that happened to me for years on end. I had my phone ringing at intervals all night. And when I answered, it was a very new baby crying and a voice saying, Mama, Mama, you killed me. You couldn't block calls at that time. I had a very elderly ill mother who was dependent on me. And I had to answer the phone. I had red paint poured over the bonnet of my car in the drive at Blackdown Nursing Home when I was there at a meeting and the note left, this is the blood of the children you murdered. I've still got a file full of hate mail um, and killing threats to kill them. This isn't new, but it has got to be stopped and I'm hoping that something will come of this. I think we've got a very different parliament. A number of things tells me that with this last intake, despite there being more Tories, I think there are more women, there are more younger people, and I am quite hopeful on a very limited front of this, this parliament um, that we will get something done. I think it's quite disgraceful, and as I say, I've been attacked. Well, thank you, Diane, for that optimistic note. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think we are in a better position than we have been for a long time um, yes. with the new intake, for example. And I think that, um, you know, we've got, particularly on issues like buffer zones, there's cross-party support for that. This isn't, I, I think there's also a sort of sense that this isn't very British. You know, it's something that's seen as very American and, 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 and there's, a, there's a cohort of 
older MPs who perhaps object to it on that on that basis. Uh, but yes, okay. Well, Diane, thank you so much for this. Thank you. For so <laughs> grateful, and I can't wait to share the comments with you. And thank you to everybody who attended. We'll let you know about future events. And if you'd like to support BPAS's work, um, please consider becoming a friend of BPAS um, with a small monthly donation. Just um, head to friends of BPAS. I believe it's .org, but just Google it. But thank you all so much, and thank you for your lovely comments. Um, as well. I'm so grateful um, for, you know, for Diane for you giving up your time and yeah and everybody on the chat is too. Oh, that's great. Okay well Diane I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a post-meeting chat with you anyway but for now I'm going to close this chat and send you a different link if that's okay but thank you all so much um, and do stay in touch and I'll pass on all your messages to Diane. Okay thank you all. Bye-bye.